Good afternoon. Welcome everybody to our webinar today. My name is Karen Moeller. I'm a neuroradiologist at Norton Children's Hospital and I'll be co-moderating today with Dr. Dan Williams. I especially, want to, I especially want to welcome all of our guests from all over the world. We really appreciate you being here and your participation very much enhances our society. So thank you. And our annual meeting is just around the corner, September 9th through 13th. It's virtual this year and there, there's a lot of different ways you can find the registration. You can find them on our website using this link or this QR code with your phone. And I have to say, I was at the ASNR virtual meeting this year, and it was an amazing experience. It exceeded my expectations in every conceivable way. The education was amazing to have the images right in front of you. And of course, it's not the same socially, but you can connect to your friends that are there at the same time. And I'm really looking forward to that with this meeting also. A couple of announcements before we get started. You can ask questions during the lecture using the Q&A panel. And if you want to just discuss things, make some comments, use the chat box, and you connect, can connect with other people. And you have a choice of talking to all the panelists or to all the attendees with this drop-down menu. And if you don't want to be distracted, you can minimize the chat box during the lectures. You can claim CME credit for today's lectures, and you do that by going to the ASNR website and then finding the Education Connection tab. And you'll be asked to answer a couple of survey questions after which you'll be emailed the CME credit. So here's the disclosures that our faculty for today have listed here. And the objectives for today's lecture, including going over the normal anatomy of the head and neck, including the fascial planes and spaces. We'll look at typical and atypical lesions on cross-sectional imaging. And then we'll also look at challenging cases in which the fascial margins are indistinct or if the lesions occupy more than one space. So besides our upcoming virtual meeting, there's also the first combined meeting between the European and American Society of Head and Neck Radiology beginning September 22nd. That's also virtual, so stay tuned for information about that meeting. And here's a list of all of our Talking Heads and Neck webinars. And this, of course, is our last one, but you can access all 10 of these lectures using the ASHNR YouTube channel. You can also find them at the ASNR website under the Education Connection panel. And with that, I'm going to introduce today's two speakers. I'm thrilled to introduce them. I first encountered their speeches at the Utah Head and Neck Imaging course, and I've been huge fans of both of them ever since. So Dr. Karen Salzman is a professor of radiology and imaging sciences at the University of Utah School of Medicine. She's also the neuroradiology section chief and fellowship director there. She holds the Leslie W. Davis Endowed Chair in Neuroradiology, and currently for the ASHNR, she's on the Rules Committee and Education Committee. Dr. Phil Chapman recently moved to North Carolina to become the Director of Head and Neck Imaging at Duke University Medical Center, and just prior to that, he was at the University of Alabama, where he was Section Chief of Neuroradiology. And for the ASHNR, he's the Vice Chairman of the Education Committee. So with that, I give you Dr. Salzman and Dr. Chapman. Enjoy the lectures. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be part of this series. I first want to thank the organizers, Dr. Christine Glastonbury, the ASHNR Education Committee Chair, and Dr. Kelly Robson, the ASHNR President, for the opportunity to speak. I'll be talking about the fascial spaces of the head and neck. I'm a consultant and book author for Elsevier. I'm going to start by reviewing the basic anatomy of the head and neck, looking at the fascial planes that divide the suprahyoid neck and infrahyoid neck into spaces. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time identifying the spaces and their contents because it really allows a really amazing anatomic basis for differential diagnosis. So there are multiple complex anatomic areas of the head and neck. We're going to be looking at the suprahyoid and infrahyoid neck today. It's divided at the hyoid bone, which is really the central fascial attachment for the deep cervical fascia, um, which 
is an important anatomic landmark. So let's get serious about the fascia. Fascia was originally described um, or kind of identified by anatomists in the early 1800s. It's this thick, dense connective tissue, and it was kind of rediscovered by the surgeons when they realized it was a relative barrier to the spread of infection and tumors. And so for us as imagers, it's really important for the key understanding of the suprahyoid and infrahyoid neck. Um, there are three layers of deep cervical fascia. In yellow, we have this superficial layer of deep cervical fascia, which is really investing fascia. The middle layer of deep cervical fascia in surrounding the viscera, so visceral fascia, and then the deep layer of deep cervical fascia, which is really important for the retropharyngeal space as well as the perivertebral space seen here in blue. This fascia cleaves the neck into spaces, which is really helpful understanding the anatomy of the neck. So the three layers of deep cervical fascia are nicely identified on this graphic diagram. At the level of the nasopharynx, we know where the nasopharynx, we see the nose, we see the mucosa of the nasopharynx. This superficial layer of deep cervical fascia seen here in yellow completely encircles the masticator space, the parotid space, as well as the musculature, the trapezius in this case. It also contributes to the carotid sheath, all three layers do. Um, the middle layer of deep cervical fascia seen here in pink represents the deep margin of this pharyngeal mucosal space. It also represents the anterior margin of the retropharyngeal space. And then the deep layer of deep cervical fascia is seen here in blue, surrounding the perivertebral space as well as the retropharyngeal space. At the level of the oropharynx, we see the superficial layer of deep cervical fascia in yellow surrounding the masticator space, the parotid space, as well as the musculature. The middle layer of deep cervical fascia we see here along the posterior margin of the oropharynx and the anterior margin of the retropharyngeal space. And then the deep layer of deep cervical fascia in blue involving the retropharyngeal and danger spaces as well as the perivertebral spaces. In the infrahyoid neck, we see the superficial layer of deep cervical fascia along the musculature, the middle layer in pink surrounding the viscera, and then the deep layer in blue along the retropharyngeal space and perivertebral spaces. So we're going to start with the five major spaces of the suprahyoid neck. And we'll start with the peripharyngeal space. This is an important space um, because it's really helpful to identify where a lesion of the deep face may occur. It's primarily fatty filled, but the location of this can be key to understanding what a lesion is in the suprahyoid neck. The pharyngeal mucosal space present in the midline is really just the pharynx um, and is that tubular structure from the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and hypopharynx. The masticator space is present laterally, seen here in purple, surrounded by that superficial layer of deep cervical fascia. We have the muscles of mastication from lateral to medial. We have our masseter muscle, temporalis muscle, lateral and medial pterygoids. The parotid space in green is surrounded by the superficial layer of deep cervical fascia. And within that parotid gland, we have glandular tissue, lymph nodes, the facial nerve, as well as some veins. And then the carotid space which is involved by all three layers of deep cervical fascia, in, includes very important structures, the internal carotid artery, jugular vein, as well as cranial nerves 9 through 12. So there are two very important midline structures. These posterior midline structures include the retropharyngeal and danger space. We see the retropharyngeal space here, uh, outlined by that deep layer of deep cervical fascia and the danger space more posteriorly. It's important to remember that you can't actually differentiate these spaces on imaging. However, the uh, danger space is really a conduit for retropharyngeal space disease to extend it into the mediastinum. And again, this deep layer of deep cervical fascia provides the lateral margin, which is known as the alar fascia, as well as the posterior margin of the retropharyngeal space and this slip of tissue that separates the retropharyngeal from the danger space. The perivertebral space has this prevertebral and the paraspinal portions. The infrahyoid neck um, contains three spaces that cross the hyoid divide, the carotid, retropharyngeal, and perivertebral spaces. And this space, the visceral space, I wanted to just mention, it's the only space that is present only within the infrahyoid neck. It's surrounded by this middle layer of deep cervical fascia in pink. So let's talk about each of these spaces. The parapharyngeal space is nicely identified here as this triangular fat-filled space. There may be some salivary rest here as well, but primarily the contents are fat. And it's really important because it's easily identified. Its displacement can help 
determine where a primary lesion is located. Um, and importantly, it does extend posteriorly into the submandibular space. So there is a connection so that potentially an infection of the submandibular space can extend into the parapharyngeal space or vice versa. So let's look at the pharyngeal mucosal space or surface. This is really just a, uh, it's not a completely enclosed by visceral fascia. However, this um, deep um, margin is made up of the middle layer of deep cervical fascia seen here in pink. The mucosal space or surface is really just a continuous mucosal sheet. It is um, really important in that it extends from the skull base to the hyoid bone. It includes the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and hypopharynx. And the contents are mucosa, lymphatics, mitocerebral glands, and constrictor muscles. So mucosa, as we all know, is uh, the primary location for squamous cell carcinoma, the most common malignancy of the head and neck, representing about 90% of malignancies. The lymphatic ring is here because of these small uh, minor salivary gland, and they can certainly be affected by both primary um, malignant and uh, benign lesions. The lymphatic ring can be affected by lymphoma, particularly non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the head and neck. At the skull base, the pharyngeal mucosal space uh, is associated with the foramen lacerum. You can see here this middle layer of deep cervical fascia as it attaches, and at this location, it's called the pharyngeal basilar fascia. But this foramen lacerum is important because tumors of the mucosa, particularly nasopharyngeal carcinomas, can extend superiorly through the foramen lacerum and reach the skull base as well as intracranially. The lateral view nicely illustrates the pharyngeal mucosal space. Superiorly, the nasopharynx at the level of the nose is divided from the oropharynx at the level of the hard and soft palate. And then the hypopharynx is the inferior continuation of that tube of the pharyngeal mucosal space. And it's divided from the oropharynx by at the level of the hyoid bone and at the larynx and, uh, level. Here's the epiglottis for reference. So let's look at a typical pharyngeal mucosal space mass. Whenever you see fluid in the mastoid air cells, the first thing you want to do on every head and neck case is look at the nasopharynx. Is there a small lesion obstructing the eustachian tube that could be causing that fluid? Um, very important to remember that. In this case, there's a very large pharyngeal mucosal space mass, a large nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It extends laterally to affect the parapharyngeal space, posteriorly for the retropharyngeal and perivertebral spaces, and then laterally to affect the carotid. And you can see the vector of spread here is kind of posteriorly into those spaces as well as the bones. And these are important for staging purposes. The masticator space is completely encircled by the superficial layer of deep cervical fascia. It contains the muscles of mastication, the mandible, the TMG, TMJ, and a very important nerve, the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, V3, which extends to the skull base at foramen ovale. So this graphic nicely illustrates the superficial layer surrounding the masticator space. We have our muscles of mastication, masseter muscle, our mandible, our temporalis muscle, our lateral and medial pterygoid muscles. In the coronal plane, we can nicely see these muscles of mastication. We have our lateral and medial pterygoid muscles, as well as our temporalis muscle. And you can see that it extends above the zygomatic arch into that suprazygomatic masticator space. So infections can spread superiorly. Um, at the skull base, it is um, very important to remember that foramen ovale is here, and it's a typical location of spread from a masticator space lesion up into the intracranial contents. At the skull base, we nicely see uh, arrowed here anteriorly, foramen ovale for V3, and then foramen spinosum for the middle meningeal artery. This coronal graphic just nicely illustrates a tumor that's in the masticator space. It's extending onto that V3 through the mandibular canal, up V3 through foramen ovale to reach the trigeminal ganglion within Meckel's cave. And it's important to remember that perineural tumor is quite common. Um, and also uh, sarcomas live in this masticator space. Other common lesions in the masticator space are infection. And this is a typical masticator space lesion coming in from the ED, patient with trismus, can't really open their mouth, and they have a classic odontogenic masticator space abscess with a peripherally enhancing fluid collection and a um, small or rather large tooth abscess involving the molar teeth. And these molar teeth classically dump right into the masticator space. So you will see this. Um, it also nicely demonstrates this parapharyngeal fat, which is displaced posteriorly, and here's the normal contralateral side. 
the parotid space is completely encircled by the superficial layer of deep cervical fascia. It includes the parotid glands and lymph nodes. The parotid is the only gland or salivary gland to actually have lymph nodes within it. So it's susceptible to all sorts of things, including lymphoma and squamous cell carcinoma mets and other metastatic lesions. The important nerve here is the facial nerve, and it comes out of the skull base at the stylomastoid foramen. We see our retromandibular vein pretty much on every image of the parotid and it's nice because it's a marker of the facial nerve. This graphic diagram nicely illustrates the superficial layer of deep cervical fascia surrounding the parotid space. We see our intraparotid facial nerve, which you can't see on conventional imaging, but you can identify its location based on finding your uh, retromandibular vein and just lateral to that is the plane of the facial nerve. And it's an important surgical landmark because it separates the superficial and deep lobes of the parotid gland. This skull base view nicely shows the stylomastoid foramen. On the contralateral side, we see our facial nerve exiting here. We also see our mastoid tip and our external auditory canal. The facial nerve is particularly classic location for parotid tumors to extend in a perineural fashion up into the skull base and intracranial contents. The classic tumor to do this within the parotid is an adenoid cystic carcinoma, and this graphic nicely illustrates an adenoid cystic carcinoma extending superiorly through the stylomastoid foramen along the cranial nerve 7, facial nerve. Here's two different examples of a classic parotid space mass. We see a large mass um, widening the distance between the mandible and the styloid process. Here's our normal parotid gland on the opposite side. We can see that this involves both the superficial and deep lobes of the parotid. We can see that the peripharyngeal fat is displaced medially by the mass, which helps identify the location of the mass. This is a different patient showing a deep lobe mass, which displaces this peripharyngeal fat medially, helping identify this as a parotid space mass. And in this location, a benign mixed tumor or pleomorphic adenoma is the most common lesion. Let's look at the carotid space. This has all three layers of deep cervical fascia. It's a really important space because it has the internal carotid artery and jugular vein, as well as cranial nerves 9 through 12 and the suprahyoid neck. It's identified here in surrounded by this orange line. Um, it's a really interesting space because it has multiple cranial nerves, 9 through 12, as well as the carotid and jugular vein. Along its medial margin, we have our sympathetic trunk, as well as the retropharyngeal space medially, and then laterally and anteriorly, peripharyngeal fat, and the styloid process. At the skull base, it interacts um, with the carotid canal, jugular foramen. We can also see our cranial nerves 9 through 11 along the jugular foramen, and then hypoglossal canal and hypoglossal nerve medially. The carotid space in the infrahyoid neck has only one cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, as well as the carotid and jugular, and the vagus lives along this posterior margin between these vessels. It's important to remember that the internal jugular lymph nodes live very close to the infrahyoid carotid space, but do not are not within it. This just shows these deep jugular nodes, which are typically associated with the carotid space. Here's this tubular structure showing the carotid space from the skull base uh, to the aortic arch. If you're dealing with a vagal neuropathy, particularly on the left, you want to image all the way down to the AP window so we so you can include that uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. So let's look at a typical carotid space mass. We see that uh, it's a deep space mass. We can see the fat, peripharyngeal fat displaced anteriorly. So we're thinking it's probably a carotid space mass. We also see the carotid artery immediately displaced. Here's our normal fat on the contralateral side helping identify where this lesion is. Here's a different patient with a vagal schwannoma. Um, it nicely illustrates how, in addition to the anterior displacement of peripharyngeal fat, we have actually lateral displacement of this posterior belly of the digastric muscle. On the normal side in this patient, we see the normal posterior belly of digastric muscle here, and then the carotid space immediately with the internal jugular vein and the internal carotid artery. Here's a classic carotid space mass, an extremely vascular mass. So you're thinking, is this a paraganglioma or a schwannoma? But we can see here the internal and external branches of the carotid artery being splayed in a classic carotid body tumor. 
So let's spend a couple minutes kind of looking at the suprahyoid neck. How do we determine where a lesion is located? Where's the center of that mass? Um, the location of that parapharyngeal space fat can really help identify the location. And by identifying the location, we can decide what kind of lesion it is most likely. So if we have a parapharyngeal mass, the parapharyngeal space fat is going to be displaced laterally, a masticator space mass, posterior displacement of the parapharyngeal fat, a carotid space mass, we have anterior displacement of that fat, and then a parotid space mass, medial displacement of that parapharyngeal space fat. So let's look at those spaces that cross the hyoid divide, carotid, retropharyngeal, and perivertebral spaces. So as we mentioned, the visceral space is only in the infrahyoid neck, and we're going to concentrate on the carotid, retropharyngeal, and perivertebral spaces. So there are many important nerves in the neck, and I just wanted to highlight a few and their locations. The recurrent laryngeal nerve is present within the visceral space. It lives right at that tracheoesophageal groove seen here in yellow. The vagus nerve is within the carotid sheath, within that carotid space between the internal and internal carotid artery and internal jugular vein posteriorly. The sympathetic trunk is right along that medial margin of the carotid space. The phrenic nerve lives in the perivertebral space along the anterior margin of the anterior scalene muscle. And the brachial plexus is located um, as it exits through the anterior and middle scalene muscles. So let's look at the retropharyngeal space. It's a really interesting space. Um, it's certainly an emergency room doctor's concern whenever a patient comes in with neck pain because they're really concerned about a retropharyngeal abscess. So let's look at that fascia. So anteriorly, the fascia is made up of that middle layer of deep cervical fascia seen here in pink. So the retropharyngeal space is just posterior to that pharyngeal mucosal space. Uh, the posterior margin is made up of that deep layer of deep cervical fascia, is, as is the lateral margins, also known as alar fascia here. In the suprahyoid neck, we have both medial and lateral retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which are really important. Um, the lateral lymph nodes are also known as the nodes of Rouvier, and they are commonly affected by multiple tumors, particularly tumors of the nasal pharynx, posterior oral pharyngeal wall, and hypopharynx and also thyroid cancers. And it's a really important node to identify because they are not easily seen by our ENT surgical colleagues. So let's look at this retropharyngeal space in the sagittal view. It extends from the clivus down to T3. There is this fascial trap door that we talk about. We can't really differentiate the retropharyngeal and danger space, but it's important to remember that the danger space is really just a conduit that allows infection from the retropharyngeal space to extend into the danger space and then into the mediastinum. Typically, this is related to a lymph node in the suprahyoid neck that gets infected either by a tonsillitis. The lymph node becomes an abscess and then, and then it sort of ruptures into that space. And then these lymph nodes, again, are really important both with infection and in tumor. Here's a classic case of a retropharyngeal space mass. We know we're in the retropharynx. We see that we're posterior to this normal parapharyngeal fat on both sides. It's being displaced. We see we have this necrotic lesion. We see normal prevertebral musculature medially. We see carotid laterally, and these are necrotic retropharyngeal lymph nodes related to a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Here's another common lesion, classic uh, case from the emergency room showing in retropharyngeal abscess as this peripherally enhancing fluid collection. We see that we are posterior to the pharyngeal mucosal space. We see that our prevertebral musculature is nice and normal appearing. There's nothing in the spine that we have to worry about, and this is a classic retropharyngeal abscess. This is a really interesting case. What we have here is um, tons of air actually within the retropharyngeal space. We see our pharyngeal mucosal space is displaced anteriorly. We actually see what looks like the fascia between the retropharyngeal space and a fluid-filled danger space, which is highly concerning. We know that we're retropharyngeal because we're medial and we see normal prevertebral musculature here and we see our carotid space laterally. The perivertebral space is primarily surrounded and encompassed by the deep layer of deep cervical fascia, seen here in blue. The anterior portion is sometimes referred to by our surgical colleagues as the carpet, and we have both prevertebral and paraspinal portions of the perivertebral space. 
Um, the prevertebral portion in the suprahyoid neck includes the prevertebral muscles, the longus coli and longus capitis muscles, as well as our vertebral arteries and veins and the vertebral body. The paraspinal portion is primarily made up of the paraspinal musculature and the posterior elements. So in the infrahyoid neck, we have a lot of other important structures, including the scalene muscles, brachial plexus, and phrenic nerve. So again, here is our deep layer of deep cervical fascia in blue surrounding the musculature as well as the uh, vasculature and nerves. So this is a classic example of a perivertebral space mass. We can see that it's involving the vertebral body and it's displacing this prevertebral musculature anteriorly. And that can be really helpful determining whether it's a perivertebral or retropharyngeal space process. Here's an example of discitis, again, illustrating this displacement of the prevertebral musculature. We can see the fat within the retropharyngeal space just as this thin layer, and it's displaced anteriorly. And always look at the spine when we're dealing with a prevertebral lesion, because we can see that there's way too much enhancement in this location. So, just to illustrate this point again, if you have a retropharyngeal lesion in the midline, you can help determine its location by looking at the prevertebral musculature. If it's displaced posteriorly, you want to think about a retropharyngeal lesion. If it's displaced anteriorly, you want to consider a perivertebral lesion. So here's just another classic example of a retropharyngeal space abscess with prevertebral soft tissue swelling on the scalp view. Here's a peripherally enhancing abscess within the retropharyngeal space. In contrast, this is a young patient who came to the emergency room with neck pain. They got a soft tissue neck CT. And you see this amorphous thickening, can't really determine is it perivertebral, is it retropharyngeal. We see that the visceral space is displaced anteriorly, this uh, pharyngeal mucosal space. We see the um, thickening here, and we can't differentiate normal prevertebral musculature. Fortunately, our team was on their game, and they saw this prominent enhancement in the epidural space representing a phlegmon. And here is this classic discitis osteomyelitis that um, presented as a perivertebral lesion. So in summary, the fascial spaces of the head and neck are really important. These spaces really help um, define the different locations of the neck. The parapharyngeal space fat is really helpful to determine a deep face lesion, whether it's in the pharyngeal mucosal, masticator, parotid, or carotid space. And this anatomic basis allows a really nice construct for a differential diagnosis. Spaces that cross the hyoid divide include the carotid, retropharyngeal, and perivertebral space. When you have a midline lesion, remember to evaluate that prevertebral musculature, the longus coli, and longus capitis muscles, because this can really help differentiate lesions of the retropharyngeal versus the perivertebral spaces. And with that, I thank you so much for your attention. Hi, thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Philip Chapman. I'm at the Duke University Medical Center. The title of this talk is The Mask Faces of the parapharyngeal and adjacent spaces. In terms of disclosures, I'm a consultant and author for Elsevier Publishing. I'd like to say a special thank you to the ASHNR and especially Dr. Christine Glastonbury who asked me uh, to speak. And I'd also like to thank Karen Salzman for sharing this platform with me. It seems like only yesterday the three of us were fellows together at the University of Utah. Uh, and I have great uh, memories from that. In terms of objectives, we're going to focus our attention on the parapharyngeal space and some adjacent spaces that impact the parapharyngeal space. Hopefully, we're going to demonstrate the practical application of developing this space-specific differentials in cross-sectional imaging that Karen talked about. We're going to present a combination of both typical and atypical lesions that might be seen in the parapharyngeal space, and we're going to try to learn how to approach challenging cases in which the fascial margins or the spatial boundaries are not clear, especially near the skull base. There are two parapharyngeal spaces in the neck, one on each side. Each space primarily contains fat, and that fat is easily identifiable on CT or MRI scan. 
you can see the, the um, fat is outlined with the orange boundary here in the middle image on this axial T1 weighted image. In the coronal T1 weighted image, I think you can better appreciate the vertical extent of the parapharyngeal space that really extends from the skull base superiorly all the way down uh, to the submandibular space below. As Karen talked about, we can utilize displacement of this parapharyngeal space fat to help localize the space of origin of a primary lesion in the neck. In this case, there's a lymphoma involved in the left masticator space, destroying the mandible with soft tissue expansion medially and laterally. And you can see that there is displacement of the fat uh, medially, helping to indicate the space of origin in the left masticator space. So the list of lesions that we see in the parapharyngeal space is not very long, but we occasionally see some interesting lesions, including congenital lesions like this uh, lymphatic malformation. You can see there's replacement of the normal fat in the right parapharyngeal space. On the T2-weighted image, you can see that there's not only filling of the parapharyngeal space by this lesion, but there's also extension into the right side of the retropharyngeal space as well. So this is an interesting case in which we have asymmetric expansion of the left parapharyngeal space fat. There's increased fat in this region and this is consistent with the benign lipoma. And as the axial slices go inferiorly, we can follow this lipoma into the submandibular space and it just reminds us that the inferior extent of the parapharyngeal space is the submandibular space itself. And it also reminds us that some disease processes such as abscesses can go from one space uh, to the other along the this route. Now this graphic again reminds us of the vertical extent of the parapharyngeal space fat and that's illustrated on this axial CT. This patient had a previous bilateral tonsillectomy and as we follow the axial slices superiorly we can follow air within the parapharyngeal spaces all the way up to the skull base to the level of the condylar fossae uh, bilaterally. What else can occur in the parapharyngeal space? Well we see uh, venous structures uh, uh, quite commonly uh, the, in this case this is fairly symmetric and obviously incidental in this elderly patient. Uh, and we can also see uh, asymmetric venous structures quite commonly, and this should probably just be considered uh, normal. Uh, here's a patient uh, that I saw where there was this prominent vascular structure in the right parapharyngeal space. I thought this was a little outside the norm. I had them come back for a CTA just to make sure I wasn't dealing with some odd aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm. And this was just, um, in retrospect, probably just an incidental. Uh, varics. Now we do see some vascular uh, abnormalities from time to time. This patient had a multispatial uh, AVM, a quite bizarre appearance, but obviously there's involvement of the masticator space, parotid space, and the parapharyngeal space as well, so it makes for a dramatic uh, image here. Now when I think about the parapharyngeal space, I think about this lesion, I think about the pleomorphic adenoma and uh, or the benign mixed tumors we call it. Theoretically, these lesions arise primarily within the parapharyngeal space fat from congenital rest of salivary tissues. Now the best clue is that these are well circumscribed lesions. They are surrounded all the way around by this parapharyngeal space fat and separated from adjacent um, spaces. On CT, it's soft tissue density. It can demonstrate homogeneous or heterogeneous enhancement. It rarely calcifies. On MRI scan, it's isointense to muscle. It tends to be very hyper intense on T2 weighted images and can be similar to CSF uh, signal and it shows homogeneous or heterogeneous genius enhancement as well. Here's a, a typical uh, case of a pleomorphic adenoma. This patient uh, had a CT of the head and this lesion was seen and then uh, was worked up subsequently. You can see that there's a well circumscribed lesion surrounded predominantly by fat in the left parapharyngeal space on CT. It's um, it's isointense to muscle or, or nearly uh, isointense to muscle on T1 weighted images and on T2 weighted images is well circumscribed and hyper intense. Uh, this patient had a transcervical approach to this lesion and at the time of surgery uh, the surgeons felt like this was completely separate from the deep lobe of the parotid uh, but this was a pleomorphic adenoma. Here's another uh, patient with a uh, pleomorphic adenoma. Uh, this one uh, creates a little bit of difficulty in establishing whether this is parapharyngeal or deep lobe but if you look very closely you can see that there's a claw of normal parotid tissue wrapping around this particular pleomorphic adenoma arising from the 
deep lobe of the parotid. Now this lesion is a little bit larger. You can see it's well circumscribed, but it's pushing on the masticator space. It's pushing on the deep lobe of the parotid and pushing on the carotid space uh, posteriorly. It's heterogeneously hyperintense on T2 and shows heterogeneous enhancement. Here's another one that's starting to kind of take on this oblique trajectory as the tumor extends uh, from posterior to medial, and you can see it's hyperintense on T2 and shows heterogeneous enhancement. Now this this one was a little atypical. Certainly it's well circumscribed, uh, but not quite as hyper intense on T2 weighted images as we typically see. It does enhance here uh, fairly homogeneously. Here's the CT appearance, uh, and this is the CT image taken during a transfacial biopsy, which is typical of these uh, lesions in this location. So this is a typical case of a very large pleomorphic adenoma, and when they get this large, it becomes very difficult to know, uh, did it originate in the deep lobe of the parotid or originate in the peripharyngeal uh, space? Uh, but you can see in this case, uh, tumor extends posterior laterally through the stylomandibular notch into the deep lobe of the parotid. And I basically uh, describe uh, that the lesion involves a significant portion of the peripharyngeal space, but there's also significant involvement of the deep lobe and either the deep lobe is being invaded or is being pushed or may actually have given rise to the tumor originally. I think it's really difficult to know. Here again is a CT appearance of scalloping in this case. When I saw the scalloping, I thought I might be dealing with a very large schwannoma uh, because of this benign scalloped appearance here. Uh, but then uh, after doing the um, transfacial biopsy here, this turned out to be a, a benign mixed tumor. Here's another similar case. Again, a little bit more heterogeneous and in terms of its signal and in terms of its enhancement, uh, but these things can look pretty bizarre, but most of them are um, benign, uh, thankfully. Now, this is uh, a good reminder that even though these are benign tumors, they can recur. This patient had a previous transoral resection of a peripharyngeal space tumor. I don't have those original images, but you can see here very large tumor along this similar trajectory extending from the oral pharynx to uh, the deep lobe of the parotid gland. In this case, we seem to have a, a fairly large single um, uh, tumor in recurrence, again with heterogeneous enhancement. Now this one's a little bit uh, different, a different uh, variation on this theme of recurrent uh, disease here. This patient had a previous partial parotidectomy for resection of a pleomorphic adenoma. You can see some post-surgical changes over here in the, in the superficial aspect of the gland, but in the peripharyngeal space you can see multiple nodules uh, within the peripharyngeal space, and one of the teaching points about pleomorphic adenomas in general is that they uh, can recur, and when they do recur, most of them tend to be multinodular, and some people refer to it as a cluster of grapes in terms of its appearance. Here's that same patient. Here's the T2-weighted image showing multiple nodules just basically strewn across the uh, peripharyngeal space and into the region of the uh, parotid uh, operative bed here. Here's the post-contrast appearance. Uh, again, a multinodular uh, recurrence in this situation. So one of the other variations of this pleomorphic adenoma that we're going to see is the malignant version. And this is referred to as carcinoma X pleomorphic adenoma. Again, we've restated a couple of times that the majority of these lesions, despite their large size, despite their bizarre appearance, they tend to be benign. But the carcinoma X pleomorphic adenoma essentially represents a malignant degeneration of a benign mixed tumor. Literature suggests that up to 25% of these benign mixed tumors can undergo malignant degeneration if they are left alone. In terms of the pathologic definition, what the pathologist is looking for is a combination of both carcinoma and a background of benign uh, tumor. This is a uh, typical example of a large lesion. Again, in some ways it doesn't look very much different from our other uh, benign uh, variants of the pleomorphic adenoma, uh, but you can see a large lesion pushing uh, into the peripharyngeal space. The fat is displaced um, medially here. There's some narrowing of the oral pharyngeal airway. On T2, there's marked uh, heterogeneity in terms of the signal, and that might be a clue that we're not dealing with a benign uh, lesion. And then there's marked heterogeneity and some evidence of 
necrosis uh, or cystic change uh, within the lesion, um, but the but the uh, surrounding uh, spaces are they're compressed and kind of pushed aside, but they're not necessarily invaded. And again, in this particular example, uh, the lesion extends through the stylomandibular uh, tunnel into the central aspect of the parotid. Here's the post contrast uh, appearance again in the axial plane in the coronal view. Again, I think in the coronal view, you start to get a sense of how size, of, of how large these things can become. And obviously, the larger uh, these lesions are and the longer they've been there, the more likely they are to degenerate into uh, a malignant lesion. So here's another example of a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. This was a 69-year-old female who originally had a CTA of the neck and a CTA of the head to evaluate for stroke symptoms. Uh, here's just an axial image from the delayed post-contrast image uh, as a part of that study. So you can see that there is a heterogeneously enhancing mass in the upper aspect of the peripharyngeal space uh, in front of the carotid vessels and posterior lateral to uh, the medial pterygoid muscle. If we um, look a little bit f further inferior to this, we can see that the lesion uh, abuts the um, deep lobe of the parotid. There is some focal calcification, curvilineal calcification here, but there's a heterogeneous mass that protrudes into and displaces the fat of the peripharyngeal space. Uh, but this was thought to represent a, likely a benign uh, pleomorphic adenoma. Uh, the patient did not have any, uh, they had some other comorbid issues, so this was not um, uh, pursued specifically, uh, but the patient did have a follow-up study six months later uh, where this heterogeneous lesion appeared to be relatively stable, uh, and at that point the patient was lost to follow-up. Uh, again, you can see that there is a curvilinear area of fat along the medial aspect of this, and in many ways it, it looks very similar to the other pleomorphic adenomas that we saw, uh, in, and now uh, at this point the patient is 70 years of age. But six years later, the patient returns with this appearance, she uh, came in with respiratory distress and had to be intubated uh, immediately. You can see there's a, uh, really a giant heterogeneous mass at the level of the peripharyngeal space and extending into the oropharynx and nasopharynx, essentially occluding uh, the uh, entire airway. Here's the uh, MRI scan in that patient. Again, a large heterogeneous mass uh, occupying the entire airway. You can see the um, in the trachea tube uh, down in the level of the oral cavity here. Here's the T2 appearance. Um, and, and nothing too specific about that. Here's the post-contrast appearance. And this was resected at this time and found to represent a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. So again, even though the majority of these things uh, are benign uh, and, um, and, and low grade uh, and mostly indolent, if they're left uh, to their own devices over time, they can enlarge and they they can uh, turn into a, a more malignant lesion, in this case, the carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. Let's look at some uh, challenging cases here. This is a 30-year-old male with an upper neck and face pain, had a mass discovered in the peripharyngeal space at outside hospital, and a CTA was performed to evaluate the internal carotid artery. And you can see that there's large soft tissue mass. And the interesting thing about this lesion is there are these multifocal areas of dense nodular calcification or ossification within the lesion. The margins don't look too bad, and it doesn't really look like a particularly infiltrative lesion here. The bone windows, again, just showing these areas of multifocal and confluent ossification. So I thought, well, the common things are common. Maybe this is just a weird variant of the pleomorphic adenoma. So, of course, I go to my search bar and type in densely calcified BMT of the peripharyngeal space. And sure enough, I get this article from AJ and R from Dr. Shi and others, uh, pleomorphic adenoma with extensive ossified and calcified degeneration. And I was so elated. I was like, wow, this is what we're dealing with here. So I download the paper. I send it to the referring doc, and I feel really pretty proud about myself. But it turns out this patient did go to surgery. This was resected, and this turned out to be a mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, a relatively rare lesion, uh, but certainly in retrospect, maybe with these calcifications, I should have been thinking of something like a, a chondrosarcoma. Here's another case that it could be challenging depending on um, uh, whether you start at the top of the images or at the bottom. So in this particular examination, uh, you can see that there's a large heterogeneous uh, 
mass that extends through the parapharyngeal space. There's involvement of the deep uh, parotid, just like with our other pleomorphic adenomas. And you start to think, well, maybe we're dealing with a pleomorphic adenoma or perhaps a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. That certainly would be a consideration. But it turns out when we revisit the clinical context here, this was a 40 year old with sore throat fever and facial pain, and they had uvula and soft tissue uh, and soft palate deviation on examination in the emergency room. And this looks like a peritonsillar abscess. And in fact, this was a peritonsillar abscess that has extended into the peripharyngeal space. Well, this, this was drained a couple of times during the patient's hospital stay. They were treated with IV antibiotics. And at uh, some point, all of the imaging normalized. So this was simply uh, a, a variation of the peritonsillar abscess with the abscess extending into the peripharyngeal space itself. What else is challenging about the peripharyngeal space? Well, as we go superiorly near the skull base, it, it all gets very complicated, right? It's particularly problematic near the skull base. Here's a uh, pleomorphic adenoma. We've looked at this lesion before, but here's the top of the lesion. And notice its relationship to the masticator space, the V3. This is the uh, extensor uh, villi palatini muscle. There's the fossa of Rosa Mueller mucosa extending deep, the carotid space, the parotid, the deep parotid, and even the temporal mandibular joint. So this is where uh, it gets very difficult to sometimes know the exact anatomy or the exact origin of a lesion. But let's look at some cases in this region. So let's look at this lesion that uh, created a little bit of difficulty in determining whether this was masticator space or peripharyngeal space. This was a 28-year-old with headache and neck pain who was found to have a mass. And you can see there's a very large uh, soft tissue mass here. It's heterogeneous on T2. It enhances fairly confluently. And I think it's very difficult to know whether this originates on these images in the peripharyngeal space or is it arising from the masticator space. You can see some residual fat displaced medially here. But if we follow this lesion superiorly, especially the post-contrast images, we can see that the lesion extends not only up to the skull base, but actually through the skull base. And we can see the coronal post-contrast image here. The lesion actually extends through the foramen ovale and into Meckel's cave here. Here's the CT reconstruction showing marked enlargement of the foramen ovale in this case. So and this, is, uh, this is an example of a V3 schwannoma, which means that we're dealing with a masticator space lesion. And this patient happened to have multiple schwannomatosis as well. But in this graphic and also in this post-contrast coronal uh, MRI scan, remember that the medial aspect of the masticator space fascia attaches to media, the medial margin of the foramen ovale. So everything lateral to that is going to be masticator space. And peripharyngeal space is actually medial to that. So the, uh, the segment of V3 of the trigeminal nerve is in the masticator space when it exits and travels through the foramen ovale. Now remember when we're dealing with the skull base and, and lesions near the skull base, it's important to identify the carotid space and evaluate the location of the internal carotid artery in the internal jugular vein. Here's a patient, uh, the patient had neck pain, they had an MRI of the cervical spine, a lesion was noted and you could see in the axial T1 image here, a well circumscribed mass that's uh, not dissimilar uh, necessarily from our other peripharyngeal space lesions except for the fact that this, this one displaces the internal carotid artery anteriorly. And in fact, it splays the internal carotid artery from the internal jugular vein. And this is a classic finding for vagal nerve schwannoma of the carotid space. These lesions tend to be smoothly marginated. They tend to show significant enhancement. There can be some cystic areas, but again, they typically displace the carotid anteromedially, and they typically dis display, or I'm sorry, it, they splay the internal carotid artery from the internal jugular vein. They are often in, in incidental finding or they can occasionally be associated with hoarseness uh, due to um, vagal neuropathy in some patients. Now, when it comes to these schwannomas of the carotid space, there are some variations. Most of these schwannomas are going to arise from the vagus nerve. Uh, however, some of them are going to arise from the sympathetic chain. And in 1996, Dr. Furukawa uh, established a rule that the vagal nerve schwannomas actually splay the internal carotid artery in the internal jugular vein, whereas sympathetic chain schwannomas do not. Uh, so this might fit uh, with that rule. Here's a patient, a 75-year-old 
with a, a presumed vagal schwannoma who also had a hypoglossal paralysis and also a vocal cord paralysis as well. Um, here's a patient where uh, the patient had neural fibromatosis type 2, so they had multiple schwannomas. So this was, again, a presumed schwannoma sitting in this location directly anterior to the internal carotid artery and the internal jugular vein, so it did not push the vessel anteriorly, did not splay the vessels. Now, uh, as it turns out, um, this still could represent a vagus schwannoma, but it could arise from one of the other cranial nerves, uh, but at least it's useful to keep in mind that given this uh, arrangement uh, and lack of displacement and lack of splaying, this could represent a cervical uh, sympathetic chain schwannoma. Here it is on the T1, here's the T2, here's the post contrast, uh, and again this patient with NF2 with multiple additional uh, cervical uh, schwannomas. Since we're talking about lesions in the, in the carotid space, let's keep in mind that not only schwannomas occur there, but paragangliomas can occur there as well. And then finally, I'll mention that uh, in this upper aspect of the neck near the skull base, we still have uh, the retropharyngeal space continues all the way up to the skull base, and we see an interesting uh, um, adenopathy associated with papillary thyroid carcinoma occasionally. This is a 30-year-old female with palpable thyroid nodule. This was uh, biopsied and ultimately resected, was papillary thyroid carcinoma. There were some localized lymph nodes in the um, visceral space of the lower neck, but there was an unusual lesion in the lateral retropharyngeal space or in the upper neck. It was hyper-intense on T1-weighted images. It was very difficult to know if it enhanced given its hyper-intensity. Here it is on T2-weighted images. Again, it's anterior medial to the internal carotid artery, so it's not uh, pushing the internal carotid artery uh, anteriorly. Between the MRI and the CT, uh, a couple of months had passed, so this thing actually enlarged uh, over time, and this was ultimately resected and found to be a lateral retropharyngeal lymph node related to papillary thyroid carcinoma. So it's one of the unique features about papillary thyroid carcinoma that no one really quite understands, but tumor uh, but uh, metastasis can go to a lateral retropharyngeal node in these cases occasionally. So always be aware and, and remind yourself to look in that location when you're dealing with thyroid carcinoma. Now, in conclusion, we've talked about the parapharyngeal space anatomy. We talked about the pleomorphic adenoma and talked about several of the varieties, especially in terms of size and contour. We've talked about the malignant varieties, carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma, and we've looked at some lesions that encroach upon the parapharyngeal space from adjacent spaces, and we've tried to take a slightly closer look uh, to the parapharyngeal space near the skull base, and we've examined some lesions in that uh, differential uh, for that location. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Again, I want to thank um, Christine for inviting me, and um, I hope everyone will join us um, in a couple of weeks at ASHNR. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is Dan Williams here. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I have a couple of quiz cases I want to show, uh, and thanks you guys for a couple of great talks there. First thing I'll do is I'll, I'll put on my ASHNR hat so that I don't uh, blind you with uh, the uh, light off my head. I'll share my screen with you guys, and uh, if uh, possible, and I'll bring this one up. I hope everyone can see that. Uh, I have a couple of cases that uh, I want to show that um, I've sent out on Twitter this week. The first case was the 51-year-old uh, uh, year female IV drug abuser uh, with, a, uh, with a sore throat. And as you can see, posterior to the um, uh, visceral compartment, uh, there's a fluid collection with peripheral enhancement that extended down into the, the low neck on this CT scan. Uh, so the questions are, within which space is the abnormality located? And the answer, of course, uh, as was clearly shown in these last uh, two lectures, is the retropharyngeal space. And the diagnosis, of course, is a, a retropharyngeal abscess. And we've seen that already. I won't belabor the point, but the, these are usually in children. This was an adult that was immunocompromised. 
And it's often seen in the set of pharyngitis, uh, which seeds the lateral retropharyngeal lymph nodes, and uh, the suppurative nodes will break into the uh, retropharyngeal space. It is important to differentiate it from retropharyngeal edema that you often see in longus collie tendinitis or internal jugular vein thrombosis or after radiation, which one can do uh, often with imaging. And uh, as was alluded to, it's important to image down through the chest to look for uh, inferior extension into the mediastinum. Uh, the second case uh, is a 57-year-old female. Everyone should get this case right now after Dr. Chapman's lecture. Left oropharyngeal swelling, a T1-weighted MRI scan shows a mass entered in the left parapharyngeal space that shows enhancement. Which space is the abnormality located in? Of course, the parapharyngeal. Uh, the diagnosis, of course, is a benign mixed tumor or pleomorphic adenoma. Uh, as far as benign mixed tumors, uh, as was already mentioned, they're from aberrant salivary gland rests in the parapharyngeal space. It is important from a surgical point of view to differentiate these from deep low parotid masses. They can rarely, occasionally, degenerate into malignant mixed tumors and uh, I've seen a number of cases of recurrence if the tumor uh, cells are spilled at surgery. Uh, so with that, I want to thank the ASHNR and Rick Harnsberger. Some of you all may recognize that book. That's the uh, second edition of his book. I learned a lot about next spaces from him, uh, as many of us did. And thanks to all the webinar participants right there. Uh, I think that's the end of my presentation, so I guess I should stop sharing my screen at this point. So as I, I see uh, Dr. Salzman here and Dr. Chapman and others, uh, there are, were a couple of questions that came through. I jotted a few down. Some were answered online. We can't uh, spend all day doing this, right? But uh, uh, I know a couple uh, had to do with the retropharyngeal space and the danger space. And does it make any difference uh, to try to differentiate those two? I think the answer is you often can't differentiate between those two, but the danger space can lead the infection down into the mediastinum. Is that right, Karen? I got a thumbs up. Must be right. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, Phil, get your face on here. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. The, it, um, when I try to start the video, it says the host will not let me, so there must be some issue. <laughs> so, um, we decided uh, that you were much better heard not seen, maybe. I don't oh. know. <laughs> well, I, have, no, I, 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 I did have, have I did have one case once that looked like retropharyngeal space, and the surgeons went in, and then I got a call from the OR that they couldn't see anything, and they needed to go through that that second layer. Oh, there he is, back again. Awesome hey. to see you. They had to go through that second layer that it was actually danger space. And it was like, oh my God, I pick, get out the packs, take a look and see what's going on and say, oh, it's probably behind that. So I have had one case that was very instructional. The phone calls from the OR are always extremely instructional. Always. Uh, there were questions about the retrostyloid space that was answered, I think, by Dr. Chapman. I think that equals the carotid space uh, in general in our terminology. Am I correct on that? Yeah, I think that's how I see it. I think traditionally the parapharyngeal space was divided into a couple of spaces that the region anterior to the styloid process and the region posterior. So you have those ter those terms pre-styloid and post-styloid. But um, I think uh, for simplification purposes, uh, most of us um, in head and neck, uh, or at least a lot of us, uh, depending on where we train, feel like uh, most everything posterior and medial to the styloid process, uh, particularly uh, up there, you know, with it, where the styloid process usually lives, is just um, the uh, upper, uh, I'm sorry, the lower cranial nerves, the internal carotid artery and the internal jugular vein, and not much else lives there. So it's technically the carotid space. Thank you, sir. Uh, there was a question uh, about differentiating between the masticator space and the infratemporal fossa. Who would like to take that one? Well, I hate to take it, but, but I will, all right? <laughs> Thank you. It, and, and, and only because, uh, you know, obviously we take, we take the anatomy apart and create a bunch of little subunits, and, and a lot of times that actually matters. Uh, but I will say that sometimes in, in, uh, 
in practical terms when we're working day to day, um, I will use the term infratemporal fossa to basically mean everything below the temporal bone, right? And so if I'm dealing with, say, a skull base osteomyelitis, where everything near that bone and below that bone is inflamed and irregular and enhancing and hyperintense on T2, I don't know that it makes a lot of difference to, to segment down into multiple anatomic subunits. So I do use the term. I'm not sure it's, it's um, actual scientific margins, but I basically use it to mean all the soft tissue below the temporal bone. So that's just me. Okay, that sounds good. Now, that leads to this next question then is, what is the, uh, uh, well, there was one about the buccal space, and then there was one about the supraclavicular fossa. The supraclavicular fossa sits right there where I'm touching on my neck. Now, it's hard to image, but I think it's lateral to the neck and above the, or deep to the clavicle, but does anyone want to define that any further? No takers on that, I see, no takers. Uh, there was a question about the sinus of Borgagni, which I have no clue where that was, so somebody weigh in on that. I can weigh in on the buccal space, but the sinus yeah. of Borgagni, you need a picture. Um, it, it, it's a defect in the buccopharyngeal fascia right off the skull base. Can you see it on a CT or MR? I don't Never look. I, it's, it's an anatomical finding and it explains the pa uh, pathological behavior at the skull base, but it's not something that I can see on a, a scan. That's good. I actually knew the answer to that. Karen Salzman, you, you wanted to discuss the... <laughs> I was just gonna talk about the buccal space because it is anterior. I wish I had a diagram, but... It's anterior to the masticator space. It's basically that little fatty tissue that's lateral to the buccinator muscle. Oh, you got a picture. Can you show it while I'm talking? That'd be good. I'll look it up. Okay, it up. can you show? Uh, but it basically is um, anterior to the masticator space. It's right next to those um, buccal or buccinator muscles. And you have the kind of parotid duct going through there. Um, and it's a, it, is, it, it is separate from the masticator space and anterior. Thanks, Dan. I can't find a picture of it very quickly. Okay, I know we're running out of time, right? I have 401, but somebody weigh in. Uh, there was a question posed that I, I can't answer at all. It has to do with diffusion imaging in head and neck, differentiating benign and malignant uh, pleomorphic adenomas. Does anybody have any insight into that? So you don't need diffusion to differentiate a benign mixed tumor for a malignant mixed tumor. I love the way Phil is disappearing from this <laughs> chicken. So when you look at the imaging appearances, um, the very heterogeneous generally, but usually pretty bright on T2 and on diffusion, these are not restricted on diffusion, a benign mixed tumor. They're usually very bright. They can look like craziness on post-GAD, but you're really looking at the T2 fat set for that high intensity very well circumscribed contour on a T1 pre-contrast. And on diffusion, there is no restriction. Now, a, a malignant mixed tumor will not look uniformly really bright on T2. It may have irregular margins and you will see areas of reduced diffusion within it. But do I use that when I see a tumor that looks like a BMT? I feel pretty comfortable in saying this looks like a BMT. You may find a focus of malignancy within that. But a straight out malignant mixed tumor does not look like a, a straight out benign mixed tumor. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes great the sense. Is okay, not I the have... only thing. Dan, you're I have one more the time. We're allowed to go over, so keep firing away. There's still a, the question from Deb Shatsky's there. Yeah, but we didn't know the answer to that, so we can't answer what that question. Deb's, what was Deb's question? Her, Deb's her Deb's question Deb's was, are there lymph nodes in the peripharyngeal space? Great question. So what does everybody think? <laughs> oh, I, I never found any, um, any anatomical, any uh, pathological nodes in the peripharyngeal. I wish Deb was on. I'd love to hear if she, why she's asking that. Oh, so she is sending us a message. She says, oh, I'm on your side, but her husband, the very eminent yes. Dr. Doug Phillips, disagrees. I'm sorry, I'm Team Debbie all the way with this. Definitely Me too. Team Debbie. <laughs> I have to. I, I, I don't know what you said, but there's never been a, a node in that space ever in the history of the world. So, 
anyway, I, I, I did want to say one more thing to, to kind of tie together all of your, all, your two talks and all these questions, and that is, why in the world learn about spaces? My residents often ask me that. Well, I think uh, it, it's a great way to approach a neck mass. Uh, years ago, Dr. Phillips uh, had uh, a talk, uh, had me give a talk called A Lump in the Neck. So when you face a lump in the neck, uh, this is a great way to approach a neck mass. And uh, residents especially like to be able to come up with at least a little bit of a differential. And this helps you. This narrows it down for you. Wouldn't you say, would you all agree to that? Does anyone agree? I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's the best way. Any lump, how to break it down into a differential. And in fact, using that system, you get to a really good differential with that. I mean, it's amazing how you can cut it down to really, really critical things uh, with it. And it's, you know, I, I, I think that's one of the things when I learned the tricks of how to do that and that book you showed was what did it for me when I was a resident reading that book. Um, once yeah. you, you know what's in that book, and by the way, they're like $400 on Amazon now. What? But if you they're, read the book, it's like the whole basis the way, the neck is really easy. There's my December 94. <laughs> <laughs> That's how old I am. Yeah, well, no questions. But it, it, it does, it really makes it very, very easy to come to a, a shortened differential. And I think that gives you a lot of confidence with moving to the next step with head and neck. And uh, so I think that's kind of, it's really useful. There's another question from Dr. Shana about differentiating between pleomorphic adenoma and Wharton tumor. If you'd like a hint about how to distinguish between the two. Why? Hey, uh, let, me, let me answer that one. Because when I worked with Hugh Curtin years ago, people would bring cases down to Hugh Curtin and have him to try to differentiate between parotid masses and he'd say, this is ridiculous. They all look alike. Just take it out. That's, that's the answer there. They, they all look alike. Now, you can refine that a little, and I may be exactly, not exactly right, but that's what he said. Dr. Well, Curtin, if you're listening, another, I hope There's another way to differentiate. You ask, does the patient smoke? Because um, Wharton tumor is yeah. the only known benign tumor induced by tobacco. But... Um, it doesn't really matter is the, is the question. You know, radiology, you're looking to find the lesion in the parotid, how many lesions are in the parotid. You know, Warthens have a tendency to be multiple or bilateral. Uh, how many lesions exactly where they are and where they might be in relation to the facial nerve. But other than that, it's FNA or take the tumor out. It's, you're there to kind of give a little guidance, but your job is not to be the pathologist with parotid masses. Agreed. And there's another one. Is there another question? Yes. Are there salary gland remnants in the masticator space from Dr. Ciala? I've not seen one. I'd love to see a, that'd be kind of fascinating. They're, parapharyn, they're in the parapharyngeal space, but I've not seen them in the Phil, you've got all the craziest cases. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> you must no. have seen one. No, well, I... I, I there actually may be uh, remnants of uh, a rest of tissue in the uh, masticator space after a biopsy, after you've biopsied and seeded the masticator space. <laughs> yeah, that would do it. Yeah. yeah, I've not heard of that either. In fact, in fact, I'm I'm really even skeptical, to be honest with you, about whether or not there are these salivary rests in the parapharyngeal space. And the and the reason is why don't you know, if you think that that's there and it's common, why don't we ever see normal salivary tissue sitting over there by itself? Why, why does it only manifest as a tumor? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I'm a little suspicious about this whole idea, but, but I have to say it because somebody asked me to give a talk and I, <laughs> it's already on my PowerPoint slideshow, so I had to use it. <laughs> Are we running out of steam or, or not? We could do this all day. Throw another question at us. <laughs> I have to go home and cut the grass. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there is actually an answer from Chris Mosier. She says you can really find it in the mandible giving rise to mucoepidermoid carcinoma. And since it's in the mandible, 
Well, since it's the mandible, it technically counts as masticated space, but these are rare. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Dr. Moja. That should have been a question. I would like to say before you all run away, a huge, huge thank you to Christine Glastonbury for putting together this outstanding ASHNR webinar series, Talking Heads and Next. Thanks, Christine. Very welcome. It's been a lot of fun and um, there is so much more to come. We're going to start in, at the end of September. We're starting Combine, European Society of Head and Neck and American Society of Head and Neck doing monthly webinars, which should be really fabulous. But thank you all. And um, Callie, under your leadership, I think this has been a really great year for ASHNR despite the chaos. And um, we have really enjoyed connecting with so many people from around the world from um, these webinars. It's really been fantastic. Um, stay with us for the meeting in a couple of weeks and come back for the joint webinars. Excellent, thank you. And remember to our international audience that the international registration rates are 50% discounted. So that's 50% uh, for a regular attendee and, and I think it's about $25 for a trainee. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks and goodbye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.